Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, the third in Gen Z's ecosystem series, entitled Platform Software Development Kit for Gen Z Enablement. The presentation will be provided by Eric Hankey from Intelliprops Inc., Bob Fry from Smart Modular, and Jim Hull from HPE. We will get started in about two minutes. We will give everyone just a few more moments to join the webinar. So hang tight, and we'll be right back with you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us for today's Gen Z webinar, the third in our ecosystem series entitled Platform Software Development Kit for Gen Z Enablement. Today's presenters are Eric Kinky from Intelliprops Inc., Bob Fry from Smart Modular, and Jim Hull with HPE. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar presentation. If you do have a question you would like to ask, please, please uh, type your question into the questions from audience section on the right-hand side of your screen. And we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, Rachel. This is Bob Fry, Senior Director of Engineering with Smart Modular. Today's Gen Z webinar is divided into three sections. I will cover the first section, which includes a brief introduction to Gen Z and a description of the Micro Development Kit or UDK hardware. Eric with Intelliprop will present the second section which covers the Gen Z host and media controllers in the UDK. He will also present three topologies and use cases for the UDK. In the third and last section, Jim Hull from HPE will present the Gen Z Linux subsystem architecture, fabric discovery, and stage a demo of the Gen Z Linux support on the UDK. As Rachel said, we'll end the webinar with a Q&A when questions may be posted to any of the presenters. Also, Rachel will be monitoring the webinar chat for questions that she will hold until the end of the presentation. Gen Z defines a new paradigm for computing, which places a shared memory pool or fabric attached memory at its center. In today's computing systems, there is no fabric interconnect, whether it's Ethernet, Fiber Channel, or InfiniBand, which allows an application to use load store memory instructions to access a shared memory pool. Today's applications are limited to addressing only memory directly attached to the local CPU. This captive type of memory is depicted by the upper green DRAM boxes. Load store access only to local memory limits the maximum working set size available to an application to the gigabytes or terabytes of memory that can be installed in one server. Loading up a single server with terabytes of memory can be inefficient and waste power by creating a problem of stranded memory, memory that is not directly accessible to other servers' applications. I recently read about a multi-physics application being run at LANL with a petabyte working set. That's 1,000 terabytes of memory. This application currently takes over six months to complete. By moving the petabyte working set to fabric attached memory and eliminating paging to secondary storage, the application runtime may be reducible to days. 
A load store access model to fabric attached memory will significantly simplify the programming model used by distributed applications. And fabric attached memory allows different types of processors to collaboratively work in parallel on problem solutions. Beyond traditional x86 CPUs, SOCs, FPGAs, GPUs, TPUs, even quantum processors are enabled to make direct load store access to fabric attached memory. The primary takeaway from this slide should be that Gen Z has standardized direct access by applications to fabric attached memory securely eliminating driver and operating system overhead. The UDK is designed to be the simplest, smallest platform that enables the development and demonstration of Gen Z operating system support, fabric management software, and Gen Z load store applications. The Lynx operating system is being made Gen Z aware by adding support for a Gen Z host controller. When a Gen Z host controller is available, software support can be developed to discover and manage fabric attached memory and other Gen Z fabric resources. Finally, with Linux operating system and fabric management support, Gen Z applications will be able to map and access fabric attached memory using load store instructions. The application access to the fabric memory, again, is entirely implemented in hardware with no operating system intervention required. UDK includes a PCIe 250 SOC host ARM card sourced from Bitware, which for the UDK is referred to as the Orthos ARM host card. The card has two external QSFP connectors, which are used to connect to a Gen Z backplane using a QSFP to 1C cable. The QSFP to 1C cable may also be used to connect to another Orthos card. Note the the Orthos card is used as a standalone host. The PCI card is not plugged into another computer, and the PCI edge connector is only used to power the card. For development purposes, the card can be accessed remotely over Ethernet, and the Orthos card is preloaded to boot the Gen Z aware Linux subsystem image and programmed with the Intelliprop Gen Z host controller to provide access to the Gen Z fabric through the two QSFP ports. Eric from Intelliprop will provide additional information about the Orthos Gen Z host controller in the next section. The ZMM is a Gen Z memory module or fabric attached memory device. The module is in an EDSFF E3.S or 3 inch short form factor. It is hot pluggable and has a maximum capacity of 256 gigabytes. The Gen Z interface has four channels, or 4C, for a total of 16 lanes, and a GTY 802.3 25 gigabit per second PHY interface. The ZMM includes an integrated switch, which allows the device to be connected to two hosts on different channels, as well as being daisy-chained to other ZMMs. You may be wondering, with only an Orthos car, host card and one or two ZMMs, how it is possible to assemble a Gen Z fabric and develop fabric management software and applications. Due to the clever design of the three-slot HP Gen Z backplane by uh, Tim McCree and others, uh, the function of the ZMM integrated switch, a variety of topologies may be created. One of the more complex topologies that Eric will discuss further is shown in the lower right-hand corner of this slide. Two of the Orthos ARM cards are connected with the QSFP to QSFP cable, as well as each being connected to a backplane 1C port with a QSFP to 1C cable. The ZMMs are daisy-chained by the backplane, allowing the three ZMMs to be shared between the ARM hosts. This configuration enables two fabric and resource managers to run independently on each ARM host, and applications can run on, on the ARM host, collaboratively accessing the Gen Z fabric attached ZMM memory. The 1C to 1C cable mentioned in the table, but not used in this configuration shown, 
It is also possible to create an even more complex fabric topology by connecting two UDK backplanes together, each having their own Orthus ARM cards and ZMMs. The UDK is a complete standalone benchtop software development platform that can be customized from one to two Orthus ARM cards and from one to three ZMMs. And as mentioned previously, multiple UDKs may even be connected together. A power supply brick is included as well as Xilinx's JTAG programmer, which allows updating the IntelliProp Orthus host and ZMM Gen Z controllers. The UDK hardware is the culmination of cooperative work undertaken by multiple Gen Z consortium member companies over the past four years. This work within the Gen Z Proof of Concept Working Group, steadfastly led by Don Boyd from HP, includes the design of the UDK backplane and cages of HP, assisted by Dell, Amphenol QSFP to 1C and 1C to 1C cables, Smart and Teleprop ZMM with Samsung high-density DRAM components, smart UDK chassis and Bitware 250 SOC card repurposed by IntelliProp. So the hardware guys have built it, and now we're hoping the software guys will come and play. So no pressure, Jim. But this is a call to action to software developers to please join Jim and others working on the Gen Z Linux subsystem developers. Uh, and Jim will discuss more of that in the last section. But before Jim, Eric will dive into the Orthus ARM host card and ZMM Gen Z controller implementation and describe UDK topologies and use cases. Eric, please take it away. <clears throat> Thanks, Bob. Uh, this is Eric Hanke, Principal Engineer of Memory and Storage Products at IntelliProp. Uh, in the following slides, I will discuss the IntelliProp Gen Z Media Controller, or ZMC, which is codenamed Mamba, uh, the IntelliProp Gen Z ARM-based host bridge, codenamed Orthus, along with several use case examples. The second generation of IntelliProp Mamba Gen Z uh, media controller is utilized within the smart modular ZMM, which Bob described. It's implemented on a Xilinx 16 nanometer FPGA. These ZMM have been used in, as Gen Z memory for various consortium demos at Supercomputing, Flash Memory Summit, HPE Discover, uh, among others. The Mamba ZMC is a dual-channel DDR4 media controller, which implements a Gen Z responder function with integrated switch and supports in-band management from a Gen Z fabric manager. The ZMC is provisioned with four 100 gigabit per second Gen Z links, utilizing the Gen Z 802.3 Phi for uh, a total bandwidth of 400 gigabits per second over a low-cost 5-meter copper cable. The Mamba ZMC implements A-key and R-key functionality, which allows for hardware-enforced isolation and carving up available memory resources between multiple hosts, which we'll discuss some use cases on later on. And there's an integrated microcontroller, which handles media maintenance functions, air handling, uh, along with providing a debug interface, which is useful uh, for development, statistics monitoring, and debug. On the right-hand side, you'll see a high-level block diagram showing the Gen Z IP complex uh, in Marin. <clears throat> the Bitware uh, uh, configuration for the microdevelopment kit. So as noted by a smart modular, the Orthos Gen Z host uh, An integrated bridge function has been implemented on the Xilinx MPSOC FPGA and enabled by the Bitware 250 SOC card. For the Orthos bridge function, we utilize dual QSFP cages, the RJ45 Ethernet interface, USB UART interface, and the Zinc FPGA. The PCIe edge connector is used for mechanical stability and power only, and, and no traffic is sent along that PCIe interface. Currently, the four Oculink connectors are unused, but could be made available with additional development and firmware updates. 
The IntelliProp Orthos is an IP complex which implements an AXI memory map load store interface to the quad-core A53 ARM processor within the Zinc FPGA. This load store interface allows for byte addressable access into the Gen Z fabric or fabric attached memory. However, since Gen Z memory is cacheable by the ARM processors, the typical access will be full cache line ads or EVICs. The IP presents a configurable requester ZMMU interface, which enables the host address to Gen Z address transformation, allowing for contiguous host to address range and a dispersed set of Gen Z component addresses. The integrated switch allows for packet relay between adjacent Orthos cards or ZMM within the microdevelopment kit or other topologies. The bridge also supports A keys and R keys, allowing for hardware enforced isolation between components. The Gen Z control op class is available via load store semantics following the requester ZMMU page table initialization. This greatly simplifies the in-band management of remote components by enabling memory mapped access to fabric attached component control space. Additional to the load store interface, there are two data movers provisioned within the Orthos bridge. The first DMA uh, is integrated within the Zinc processing system itself. This is a simple data mover allowing for large blocks of data to move between the processing system DRAM and the Gen Z fabric attached memory. The second is a special Gen Z specific DMA which allows for software defined Gen Z packets to be sent to and from the Orthos card. This allows for software flexibility and the ability to implement complex Gen Z functions. Again, on the right-hand side, you can see a high-level block diagram showing the Gen Z IP complex in Marin. On this slide, I'm showing a dual host configuration, which allows for Fabric Manager to run on one host node and the other host node to be a managed client of the primary node. Additionally depicted below is the fact that the backplane utilized within the microdevelopment kit allows for ZMM to ZMM connections enabling packet relay through the ZMM integrated switch, which allows for packet delivery from any interface on the backplane to any address range across all attached ZMMs. In the block diagram below, you can see the leftmost ZMM does not have a direct connection, connection to either host node. Once the ZMM integrated switches are initialized by a fabric manager, both host nodes can communicate with the leftmost ZMM by taking a switch hop through the middle or rightmost ZMM. This is a more complex configuration and allows for testing of various fabric topologies within a uh, simple hardware setup uh, uh, simply by adjusting the fabric initialization software rules. For example, this setup when fully populated uh, could emulate a three switch hop topology without any dedicated discrete switch, which is one of the reasons why this kit is uh, so great for fabric management software development. Uh, now I'll walk through a few use case examples and compare different uh, differences in setup, pre-configuration, and post-configuration. Here I'm showing the simplest configuration of the microdevelopment kit. A single host node and a single ZMM. Uh, no memory pooling or sharing. During configuration, the local AXI interface between the ARM processor and the Gen Z complex is used for component local initialization. Control space access occurs via the bridge uh, driver API. The host owns the ZMMU pages and the entire uh, ZMM capacity is allocated to the single host. Post configuration, all load store access to the Gen Z memory on any CPU core is cacheable to that CPU. Use cases supported by this simple configuration uh, would include load store, simple application, uh, benchmarks, latency, error handling flows, etc. Bridge driver development, initial fabric manager development, initial in-band uh, management development. Here <clears throat> I'm showing a, a memory pooling example. The configuration is similar to example one, but we've added a second host node, as you can see in the diagram to the right, with the addition of the blue arm SOC. The configuration stage is similar to example one, but the fabric manager in this example allocates a portion of the ZMM to each host node. 
This is depicted on the right with the orange node and the blue node and the associated allocated space within the ZMM with the matching color. The allocation with, within the GenZ address space does not need to be contiguous and can be broken up at the PTE page size granularity. In this particular example, the request packets can, uh, are received on separate interfaces on the ZMC, but could be configured to receive packets from both host nodes on a single interface if packet relay is enabled on one uh, or both of the Orthos cards and the link between the two cards was enabled. Post configuration is basically the same as example one. All load store access to the GenZ memory uh, is cacheable by uh, the CPU core making that load store request. There's no node-to-node -node coherency or data consistency implications in this example because the memory regions are not shared between the two nodes. Use cases supported by this configuration would include everything from example one, uh, as well as memory pooling, uh, allocation memory regions, uh, enabling the development of more complex schemes, uh, such as dynamic pooling, uh, malloc and free, for example, out of the pool. Uh, this does open up some new air flows and security flows. Uh, as an example, uh, how the memory would be sanitized when it is freed back to the memory pool. Here, in example three, I'm showing memory pooling and sharing. The configuration is similar to example two, but we've added a common shared region within the ZMM that's accessible by both host nodes. Configuration stage is, again, similar to example two, where the fabric manager allocates portions of the ZMM to each host node. This, again, is depicted on the right with the orange node and the blue node and the associated allocated space within the ZMM with the matching color. The blue and orange region at the bottom of the ZMM graphic represents a shared region within the ZMM, which is read-writable by, bo by both host nodes. Post configuration, again, is basically the same as example two for all the exclusively owned GenZ address spaces. For the shared memory region, software coherency methods uh, can be used to synchronize between the two hosts. Depending on the use case, this could be as simple as disabling the caching uh, for that shared memory region within the ARM MMU, or there may be more specific flush and sense operations that are required to be implemented in software. The use cases supported in this configuration, again, would include everything from example two and example one, uh, as well as memory sharing and synchronization between multiple nodes, and a new way of thinking about multi-node programming, allowing for load store access to the shared memory region from multiple nodes. This opens up even more uh, error flows and security flows, as well as node-to-node -node synchroniz synchronization considerations. And with that, I will hand it off to Jim Holt from HPE to discuss uh, some of the Gen Z Linux subsystem work, which has been ongoing. Take it away, Jim. Thanks, Eric. Uh, this is Jim Hull from HPE, uh, senior software engineer, uh, working on the Linux Gen Z subsystem, um, which we uh, and we have a group of people who are. Um, involved in this work. Uh, five or so companies are uh, sharing our efforts to develop this uh, open source Linux. Uh, current focus is for uh, hosts uh, with the Orthos uh, card that uh, Eric was talking about. But it's actually more general than that. It can also support the PCIe attached uh, version of the bridge that uh, IntelliProp has as well as a UPI uh, plus PCIe version. And further in the future, you can imagine uh, bridging from uh, other protocols like CXL uh, using the .mem and .io. And uh, the work that we're working on now includes uh, bridge driver, in-band management, and fabric management. So why do we need a Gen Z subsystem? Um, and there's really a couple of answers to that question. First, it enables writing native uh, Gen Z device drivers, uh, exposing the full capabilities of Gen Z, which includes access to quite a number of advanced Gen Z features uh, that are that exist at the protocol level, all kinds of fancy packets to do uh, uh, multicast and broadcast and uh, other things. And it also uh, 
enables the sharing of fabric resources across uh, Linux instances, as uh, Eric was mentioning. Uh, if you don't have the OS aware of the sharing, you really can't do sharing because uh, those memory regions would be assumed to be owned by uh, each of those local OS instances, and uh, chaos would ensue. And the second thing that the subsystem enables is uh, writing fabric management and local management services in user space because the Gen Z subsystem uh, exposes those uh, Gen Z resources uh, to user space, uh, which means you don't have to uh, implement those things in the kernel. Um, the Linux kernel community is very much in favor of a world where you have uh, mechanisms in the kernel, but policy is outside, and so doing it in user space enables that. And why are we doing this now? Well, because we want to make sure that uh, the software is ready when the hardware is. So here's a rather complicated block diagram of what the Gen Z subsystem uh, design looks like. We have kernel space down at the bottom. Uh, we have user space up at the top. Uh, the subsystem itself is those two kernel box, green boxes in kernel space. Um, it's split into two halves because there's kind of an upward facing uh, interface which enables uh, Gen Z aware drivers to connect to their devices out on the fabric. Um, and the Gen Z block driver is an example of that. It's the mechanism we would use to uh, enable uh, load store access uh, via file system and MMAP. Uh, to shared resources out on the fabric. And then the second part of the Gen Z subsystem in the kernel is kind of a downward facing API where it uh, has an API to um, Gen Z bridge drivers uh, which are written by each uh, Gen Z bridge uh, hardware company, in this case the Orthos bridge driver uh, for the Intelprop Orthos bridge. Now the yellow pieces in the kernel space are a bunch of existing kernel infrastructure that the subsystem makes use of, uh, including DMA services, um, inserting this Gen Z uh, Linux subsystem as a standard bus, and uh, using existing interfaces, uh, including a generic netlink to send messages to and from user space uh, about events that are happening, and uh, the slash sys file system interface which we use to expose uh, the Gen Z control space structures uh, to user space agents, uh, like the fabric manager. And up in user space, we have um, a fabric manager, which we call Zephyr. Um, and uh, it's a very much a work in progress, as, as is all of this software. Um, and Lamas, which is uh, the Linux local management system, which runs on each node and talks to the fabric manager uh, to have a communication over a Redfish interface. Uh, so that each node knows which Gen Z resources uh, it is, uh, has available to it and uh, which ones it's not supposed to know about. As Eric mentioned, one of the hardware features uh, in both the bridges and the uh, uh, ZMMs is uh, something we, the Gen Z spec calls the ZMMU, the Gen Z Memory Management use Unit. And it's there to uh, map local address spaces into fabric addresses. And one of the things the subsystem does is make use of that in, in order to expose um, the control space as uh, sysfs uh, read-write files. Um, this ZMMU API is still under active development. And one of the issues we're facing and could use help with is that Gen Z spec uh, includes two rather different ways of implementing a ZMMU. One's called the page grid, which has a, a fixed number of uh, page table entries in the hardware. And the other is a memory-based page table. And uh, creating an API that tries to hide that uh, rather distinct hardware implementation is, is one of the things we are struggling with. Um, and ZMMUs, of course, are there because um, Gen Z can have a huge number of uh, of address spaces, and each component it gets its own. And so uh, PTEs are uh, there to allow uh, access to that with huge page sizes, because you don't want to have uh, mappings with small numbers of pages, because uh, you would run out of resources, especially in the page grid-based uh, scheme. 
turning a moment to the job of uh, Lamas and the fabric manager uh, in terms of discovery. Um, as I said earlier, every node in the complex runs uh, the local management services or Lamas. And each of the resources that are made visible to that node by the fabric manager um, will be uh, told to that Lamas instance via Redfish, which then uh, converts that Redfish message into a Netlink call into the local kernel uh, to add that component. And uh, those components show up in the SysFS tree uh, in the path that's mentioned here, SysDevices Gen ZN uh, subnet ID component ID resource. And then each of the Gen Z drivers uh, binds to a resource based on the UUID that has been specified in that message. Uh, Gen Z UUIDs work much like PCI vendor and device IDs uh, in terms of binding drivers to them. Now the fabric manager is in charge of discovering the interfaces on the bridges, uh, finding the switches that Eric mentioned, uh, and uh, eventually discovering the, the media resources on the other side of the fabric. And it does that by doing a recursive walk of the fabric to configure and assign uh, component IDs to all the components that it finds, and uh, sending into the kernel uh, a netlink command again, which says that I've discovered a fabric component. Here's where it is. And that causes the subsystem to uh, create uh, more entries in uh, the sub file system for uh, discovery components so that the fabric manager has access to the control space. All right, at this point in the presentation, we're going to try to stop doing uh, slideware and do an actual live demo of uh, the uh, current state of the software. So I'm going to share my screen. And if you haven't already done so, you might want to make your window as big as you can so you can see the uh, text on these screens. Um, what I have here is two black shell windows uh, on a Linux machine. The top one is connected to the uh, UDK uh, serial port via a USB connection. And the bottom window is where I'm going to SSH into the uh, 250 SOC to uh, show you that the network is up and running. Um, to start with, I'm going to reboot this uh, Orthos 250 SOC. You can see that we're doing a shutdown here. We're going through U-Boot uh, firmware interface. We are getting a DHCP address and booting the kernel. I'm not expecting you to follow along all of these messages, but more demonstration of the fact that uh, because this is an embedded system, uh, it boots really fast. And so when you're doing software development and you do something stupid and cause the kernel to crash, it's really not a big job uh, bringing it back up again like it would be on some massive server. All right, the machine is up. I can log in. I can show you uh, that we are running Linux. And uh, the only difference between what you might see on an uh, ordinary server is that we're running on the ARM processors, which are identified by ARC64. I can show you that we have booted a completely standard Ubuntu 20.04 LTS uh, distribution, which is installed on the uh, 250 SOC's EMMC. And I can, in the lower window, SSH into this device. I can show you that. Um, right now, we have no Gen Z or Orthos uh, modules loaded. Uh, we just have this uh, uninteresting uh, generic IRQ module. Um, I have configured this machine not to uh, install the Gen Z subsystem and Orthos drivers by default because that makes it riskier to uh, get a successful boot when you're uh, playing with those. So I have configured it to uh, require manual intervention, which I will do now. So I've now loaded those kernel modules. And you can see Orthos and Gen Z are now installed. And that allows me to now 
go to that SysDevices uh, Gen Z directory that I mentioned earlier. And if we do a tree in this, oops, that was not what I wanted to do. If we do a tree in this, uh, you can see a control space uh, hierarchy here with uh, the core structure, for example, and all the other component uh, destination, opcode set, and all of those kinds of uh, control structures are uh, exposed here, uh, along with the um, GCID and the UUIDs. And we have a tool called LS Gen Z. which is modeled on the uh, existing LSPCI. And you can see right now there's a single bridge device represented on the fabric. It's not a very ex exotic fabric at this point, but it is the state we have right now. And we can increase the level of um, verbosity of uh, LS Gen Z uh, as high as we want. Here you can see that we have uh, the core structure uh, decoded down to all of its uh, individual fields. And if we increase the verbosity even further, uh, you can see that even the subfields in the core structure and so on are, uh, are visible uh, and uh, easily determined what state things are in uh, based on the mnemonic values as opposed to having to decode things in hex. The last thing I want to generate is that we do have a very minimal version of Zephyr, the fabric manager, um, working. Um, so Zephyr runs. And if we now look at that same LS Gen Z output, um, we can see, for example, that uh, there's now a CID that is a component ID that has been assigned to, uh, to this bridge device um, instead of the original value. And uh, there's a manager UUID for those of you who are familiar with uh, fabric management in Gen Z. Uh, we now have uh, a manager ID, your ID assigned to this uh, device as well. And that is pretty much all I wanted to demonstrate uh, today. So I think we're going back to the slides. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, it looks like we are now moving toward our Q&A portion of the call. So we do have a few questions that have come through. Um, I will just direct those questions toward the group. And whoever would like to respond, uh, please just um, go ahead and chime in. So the first question we have is, when will the Linux kernel changes be posted merged into the upstream kernel? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I'll take that one. Um, so the work we're doing is already out on GitHub. Um, if you go to github.com uh, linux-gen-z, uh, you will find all the work, uh, including Zephyr and Llamas. And uh, well, ls-gen-z isn't there yet, but it will be soon. Um, and so all the kernel work is being done in the open. Um, we want to get it to a point where um, it can do useful things on real hardware, because that's pretty much what the kernel community um, demands, that you, you can't just uh, send upstream uh, prototype code for, for, uh, for no hardware. Um, and so we're not to that point quite yet. Um, I would say that that will be an ongoing process, uh, getting it all upstream over the next um, several months and maybe up to a year. Uh, one of the problems with sending stuff upstream is that you are at the mercy of the overall kernel community. And so if they don't like what you've done, then they'll say so, and you'll get to go back and re-implement it until they um, like it in the end. Great, thanks. Um, so another question that has come through is, can the UDK, um, I believe they're trying to say, act as an interoperability test fixture? 
Or can I use the UDK as an interoperability text? Text, sorry, test fixture, goodness. Uh, I, I could take that one. So um, I, I would say yes. So uh, I think that's not its initial intent. I think we're, we're trying to focus on some of the fabric management development, software development, uh, but certainly folks could uh, acquire a micro development kit and, and plug their own components into it uh, and, and use Orthos to, to manage their components uh, as, they, as they come along. So good question. Great. We're getting several questions asking if the slides will be made available. The answer to that is yes, we will include these as an attachment in the recorded demo following this um, live presentation. So uh, just a little bit of housekeeping there. Another question that has come through is how can I get involved and help contribute to the Gen Z software development? Um, so so I, I can take that as well. So uh, if you, in, in the slide deck, you'll see uh, my email address. This is Eric Hankey. Uh, if you send me an email, I can invite you to the, uh, the, the weekly meeting uh, for the Gen Z Linux subsystem. Uh, if you want to take part or if you just want to listen in and learn, I'd uh, be happy to have you uh, contribute. Uh, also, uh, if, if you're not already, or your company is not already a member of the Gen Z Consortium, uh, be a great chance uh, or opportunity to uh, to join and start looking at specs and uh, contributing to the overall uh, development effort. Yeah, and th this is Bob Fry with SMART. I, I just would like to add, as Eric mentioned, if your company or your organization is, is already a Gen Z consortium member, then uh, you can also join within the consortium the Proof of Concept Working Group, which meets biweekly and covers both the hardware aspects of the UDK, not, not so much the software, that's the uh, meeting that Eric just mentioned, but there's a uh, uh, discussion within the Proof of Concept Working Group about uses for the UDK and the upcoming demonstrations that will be held at the Flash Memory Summit for 2020, as well as Supercompute 2020. So you, you'll see these components that we've shown on this presentation uh, demonstrated at those upcoming shows, conferences. Great, thank you. Um, just to add on to that, yes, at, at both Supercompute 20 and Flash Memory Summit 2020, Gen Z will be hosting virtual booths. And as Bob mentioned, we will have several demos available for viewing uh, in those locations. So please be sure to visit the website, genzconsortium.org, for more information and to make sure that you're able to access our booth presence there. Um, a few other questions have come through. One is, can I use multiple Gen Z kits and tie them together? Uh, I, Bob, I think you, I, I was just going to say, you, you did mention that in your uh, presentation. You want to you wanna take that question, Bob? Yeah, I'll, I'll just address the first part of it. So yeah, at, in, in the uh, first section of the webinar, there was highlighted a 1C to 1C cable, which does allow two backplanes to be connected together, so that if you had two UDKs, each with their own backplane, they can be connected. That is a, a fairly uh, complex uh, topology. And um, you know, as Eric mentioned, there's support required for each of these different types of topologies. I'll, I'll pass it to you, Eric, just to discuss what's involved with uh, supporting uh, two UDKs connected together. Yeah, so, so a couple things uh, there, and there's a few ways to do it. So one is the 1C, 1C. Uh, that you're uh, describing. Uh, the other one, uh, depending on how uh, they're coupled, could be via uh, QSFP cages on the Orthos cards themselves. Um, so you could cascade them uh, together. So from um, a, uh, an IP perspective, um, you know, the integrated switches would need to be enabled and turned on, um, and that would need to be uh, configured and programmed by 
uh, the Fabric Manager uh, to enable that. But there's nothing, well, there, there, there is a limit within the IP. Uh, the total addressable components does have a limit. Uh, but you'd have to have many, many <laughs> microdevelopment kits coupled together before you, you'd hit that limit. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Another question that has come through is, can the UDK kernel system handle dynamic memory ads removal? Yeah, I'll take that one. So today, uh, the code in the current state, the answer is no, but that is part of the design and would be one of the things that uh, we'll be working on uh, as we uh, get things working here. Basically, the way it works is that um, the Fabric Manager, uh, if there's a, a new region of memory, would send a new message to uh, whichever uh, Lamas instances are supposed to see that memory, and uh, they would uh, make their Netlink calls into the corresponding kernels, and uh, that resource would become available. We'd bind a driver to it, and uh, and it would work. And I'll, I'll just add that the ability to uh, remove and add resources on the Gen Z fabric is part of the design uh, for Gen Z. Uh, you know, composability is a term used for Gen Z fabrics, and uh, that certainly is supported by the architecture and the design of Gen Z fabric attached memory and resources. Um, next question, is the Gen Z Linux subsystem software open source? Yes, all of it is. Short answer, I like, those are great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we have time for one more question. What Gen Z specification version is the Orthos Bridge, run Orthos Bridge and ZMM running? Uh, yep, yeah, good question. So uh, core spec version 1.1, 1.1a, uh, 1 .1 I guess, is the specific spec. Great. So I um, want to provide a bit of contact information for some folks uh, from these member company, um, from these member companies being represented today. Um, so for purchase of a microdevelopment kit or ZMM, contact Arthur Sanyo at arthur.sanyo at smartm.com. Then for the Gen Z Linux subsystem meeting invite, Eric on the call today, Eric Hankey at ehankey at intelliprop.com. For Gen Z IP for bridges, which is media controllers and accelerators, you can reach out to Larry Cleland at lcleland at intelliprop.com. And then for Gen Z Linux subsystem implementation details, Jim, who has also been on the call today, Jim Hull at jim.hull at hpe.com. We'd like to also thank our presenters again today, Eric Kinky uh, from Intelliprop, Bob Fry from Smart Modular, and Jim Hull from HPE. And thank everyone for attending. Um, you can visit us at genzconsortium.org and follow us on social media, media at Gen Z Consortium. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And again, thanks to our presenters.